It's about priorities, not just what you have to get done, but how you get them done and the order that they come in. We're going to talk about this offseason and touch base with Tony Pauline from Pro Football Network about the draft coming up today on Locked On Chiefs. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. From the land of the free and the home of the Chiefs, this is the Locked On Chiefs Podcast. Welcome back, Chiefs Kingdom. Glad you're with us. This is Locked On Chiefs, your daily podcast all about your Chiefs on the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day here in every free platform. That's where you can find us. Like, sub, and hit the bell on YouTube as well as leave us an iTunes review. Let us know what you're looking for and how we're doing. Thanks for making us your first listen. I hope that you'll find another listen on the Locked On Network. Hopefully the draft show that you can listen to me and Eric Crocker on. And, you know, that is really what it's about this time of year is getting into the draft. That's what I do. You can follow me on Ryan Tracy NFL on Twitter. And I run Rogue Analytics and Performance Consulting. And this is that time of year when we talk about how to evaluate players, both in free agency and the draft, a lot of physiological athletic performance metrics. That's what I do. You can also find me on RGR Football and the LO Draft Show. Welcome. This is going to be fun. Tony Pauline from Pro Football Network is going to join me later. Uh, A guy that's covered the draft for a very long time and has some takes about where he sees the Chiefs that aren't necessarily the same as you hear from the mainstream media. So I want to get a little outside perspective, a little different take on how we're going to get there. It's a fun conversation. I think you guys are going to dig that as well. But before we get there, we have to get there. And that means making some decisions. Some priorities have to be outlined. This has already been done inside of uh, Chiefs headquarters Arrowhead Drive. We have to get caught up on them. And clearly, the freeing up of some cap space was certainly at the top of the list. They accomplished that by the release of Anthony Hitchens. That's not the only thing that they're going to have to get done. There will be more moves in what order determines how they can get other pieces done. There's still this franchise tag aspect looming. The tackle tag is likely, we don't know what the numbers are yet, it's likely going to be upwards of 18. And that puts a crimp on what the Chiefs want to do currently. As we sit here at recording, the Chiefs are a shade above 11 million, just even. Um, <laughs> I don't want to get into the numbers. Uh, 11 million, 188, and some change. That's not a whole lot. It's certainly not enough to do a franchise tag. So there's more maneuvering that has to be done. We all know uh, we talked about Frank Clark a little bit. Uh, this is going to heat up. We're going to talk about him more, a little bit more today as well. Um, in how you replace a player like that. But we know that this has to be done. There are other things that have to be done. There's a rework of Patrick Mahomes' contract that needs to be done as well. And that all leads to clearing space so that you can apply the franchise tag. And then you're going to have some space left over. Now, we've run the calculations, and it could be anywhere from 5 to $25 million in cap space that you're going to spend on free agents. Some that are yours that you're going to re rack and some that are others. So when we take a look at priorities, we have to go in that what hits the field the most. And this is not something that I think they're going to splurge on, on any one position group overly. It may be a signing or two. It, it has to bolster some things, but you can see a veteran wide receiver. You can see a veteran edge, maybe somebody who's already played for this team. You could see a veteran corner or safety as well. I don't think they're going to go the veteran linebacker group uh, just because I don't see a whole lot of talent out there that fits what they want. I think this last two drafts of picking back-to-back linebackers is uh, a sign that we're going to see more youth at that position. Likely, in my opinion, going to be a day two or three pick in this draft. Again, Can three consecutive linebackers is what I'm thinking they're going to have to do. Now, they're also going to have to get a veteran in there in the free agent market, whether it's Ben Neiman returning or whether it's somebody else. But I don't think they're going to be a starting level player. I don't think they should be a starting level player because that has to maintain your cap space. And that leaves us with the the marquee pieces of an edge defender and a wide receiver. And I think the coaching staff is going to lead towards the wide receiver. Because it does give you, with experience comes the ability to adapt, to get into a new offense. It's very difficult to get in the read offense. We've seen that with rookies. We saw that with Cornell Powell 
uh, that last year they selected with the hope that he could get in there. We saw it with Noah Gray, even as a tight end, getting in this offense was difficult and <clears throat> poses a, a challenge that delays your effectiveness on the field. And I think that's what they need is an immediate hit to help balance out Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill, and McCole Hardman. Now, I don't think that that precludes them from a draft selection, but I think they have to go there first. And by doing that, I think that contract in the range that they want to spend is going to be lighter than a spend on a high-end edge rusher. So I feel like you can give that a little priority. You can bring in a second-tier edge rusher, much like Melvin Ingram. I think that that negotiation is going to go on for a while, so you have the time there. But that's what it comes down to in trying to stagger the pieces so that you can hit your targets. That's what it's all about. And at the end of the day, that's what's going to get you home because it is about the order that they go in. And that's the priority that how you get things done. So I think all this contract work is going to come out relatively quickly um, after what we talked about yesterday and the, and the staff assignments as well. But then look for a wide receiver to be something, not, not day one of free agency, but relatively quickly because I think they want to get a name that is going to help them on the field in the first year and not rely on a rookie to try to get into the flow of it. You got real lucky with getting three really good contributors in your rookie class last year. I think they're going to get that again, maybe not as much of an impact and certainly not at the specific position of wide receiver. What they do need to do is get an edge in free agency that can mentor and they have to get, I think, a premier one in the draft, a high end, either with 30 or 62 or should they move around in that area, on the edge. I think that's got to be the plan. Right now, the more work that I do on the edge group, the more I I'm comfortable with that plan. And I want to get some outside information and opinion from Tony Pauline. He's going to join us next. I think you guys are going to enjoy that if you haven't heard from him before. But I also need to tell you that if you want to lay some action, it's not just that the basketball season is starting. It's almost at its climax, even though the football season is coming down. March Madness is nearly here, and you can lay your money down on the odds and the totals and the player performance props that you want to get into. You can find it all at betonline.net, and it remains the best spot for all the scores and podcasts and news of the season. It's not just basketball. It's all kinds of other sports through the summer, hockey, boxing, et cetera, et cetera. Head over to the website now. You can do it from a mobile phone or, or computer, whatever you want to do. That's where you get all the information. Check out Bet Online, where the game starts. Well, folks, glad that you made it back. It's been a little bit. This is Tony Pauline. You've heard from him before with Pro Football Network, with Believe Network, all kinds of draft coverage. If you haven't been reading him for the last 20 years, I don't know what you're doing. How are you, Tony? I'm okay. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I've been reading it for a long time. We talked, I think it was last, not last draft probably. cycle. <laughs> That's the way it goes. I say that every time I type something out. But uh, when I go back, it's been a couple of years. I want to say it was the 2019 last time we talked. Just like this post-COVID thing, I wanted to start real simple. How do you feel the process goes now with, I feel like, less emphasis on the combine and things and more about personal training? And where do you think it is in terms of scouting and getting a read on players versus it was three, four years ago? Uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, uh, with, with the bubble bursting, for lack of a better term, at the combine, I think it's going to be, I know it's going to be business backed uh, as usual, uh, but it's going to be close to it. I mean, um, listen, the, 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 the thing with the trainers was nothing new. I, I, it, it's something that people who watch the combine on the NFL network or now on network television don't see, but the trainers are always there. Uh, they they fill up com, uh, conference rooms at the end of Indiana Convention Center. They go to hotels like the Omni uh, Severin, and they rent big rooms. At, and they rent these rooms so their players can come in and get stretched and massaged and work on their 40 starts and work on their uh, short shuttle touches and things like that. So this is nothing, you know, the, the trainers, it's nothing new. Uh, the fact that they weren't going to be able to see the trainers, the players, because they were in a bubble, that is kind of what uh, was uh, – kind of ex explode had things explode um i don't think the scouting is going to be any different i think what's different now is the nfl is getting more involved in scouting events which is making them worse you see the nfl getting more and more involved in the combine so now what happens well you have the bench press the same day as the on the field workouts which does not sit well with a lot of players and people and trainers and now you have the workouts moving to 
uh, you know, prime time on network television, which again does not sit well with a lot of people because the players have to sit around all day before they work out. Combine workouts usually take at, start at nine o'clock in the morning, and the next group goes at eleven o'clock in the morning. Pro day workouts usually start at nine o'clock in the morning. Now they're working out at seven o'clock at night, which uh, a lot of people don't like. So I think the process is pretty much, you know, post COVID, if you will. Scouts are traveling to games. Scouts are talking to coaches. Uh, you know, the scouts are going to be doing the same thing. I was at the Shrine practices, which we didn't have a Shrine game in 2021. I was at Senior Bowl practices. It was business as usual. I haven't heard how the interview process is going to work at the Combine. If you've been following me at Pro Football Network, we've been ahead of that story. And, and I was told that it may be more of a virtual interviews, which teams don't like because they want to get in the room with the player and they really want to challenge the player. I've not heard uh, exactly what they're going to do yet uh, as far as the interview process, which may be a little bit different. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing how that comes down and, and how they can actually put a little bit different kind of pressure, whatever it comes down to, because they want to see a reaction, right? Uh, it's yeah. all part of the the eval. That said, we're evaluating all these different position groups. We always We always hear about what this particular class is about. And for me, I have my takeaways, but I think this lines up pretty good for Kansas City in particular, but strength versus weakness of this draft class where do you like it and where don't you like it oh it depends on what part of the draft we're talking about i mean the top of the draft is filled with defensive impact defensive players and you know you go back 30 years ago before everybody was reaching and overdrafting quarterbacks it was the impact defensive player that was coveted uh, in, in the nfl draft the andre bruce's types you know the some of them were busts and some of them turned out really good and that's what you have this year. You got a lot of good impact defensive players at the top with Kayvon Thibodeau, Aiden Hutchinson, David Ajabu, uh, Derek Stingley Jr. I think uh, later on in the draft, when you get the late part of round one, it gets very strong at the offensive tackle position. Uh, late part of round one, second round, third round, outstanding at the tight end position in day two and the beginning part of day three. Uh, some decent cornerbacks, some decent safeties in day two. I think those are the positions of strength. I think uh, it's a little weak at running back. You've got some good day two running backs, but it kind of falls off after that. I think it's terrible at center after your top two guys, Tyler Linderbaum and Cameron Jorgens. That that brings me to Cole Strange. Do you, do you have him on your board as a center? Uh, I do. I do. He played some center at the uh, – at the Senior Bowl, and he did relatively well. I don't think it really matters where you have him on the board. I, I mean, I think, you know, because a team takes a guy at X, Y, Z, you know, position. We saw it a couple of years ago with Isaiah Wynn. Remember the uh, when everyone was shocked that the everyone had him projected to guard and, that, and the Patriots took him at tackle? I don't think when you're looking at the interior uh, part, uh, interior positions, interior blocking positions, spit it out, Tony, it really makes a big difference. So if I have – if somebody has strange as a guard – and the team selects him as a center. I don't think that's a big, uh, uh, really not that much to it. Let's get into a couple of specifics because Chiefs have needs. There's a lot of teams that have needs. Uh, one that I feel like is really apt for them being in the 30s for the, the first selection, uh, at 62 for the second, that group of wide receivers, it feels to me like there's a lot of hype, but maybe a, not a lot of fire. Do you feel that there's going to be four, five, maybe three, only three wide receivers in this first round? I could see four, maybe five. <clears throat> I, my, my receiver rankings are a lot different uh, than other places at this present time, although you're starting to see, you know, Traylon Burks, who I have as a second-round pick. <clears throat> now, all of a sudden, he's starting to fall through the ranks in these mock drafts. I think you could have five. I think four is probably a better number. So is it the sweet spot to be on day two, or do you think this particular group of wide receivers, you, you need to use that selection at 30? Yeah, I, I don't think it really matters. I, it depends on the type of receiver you're looking for. I mean, Drake London is a first-round pick, but he's a, you know, a bigger, fluid, underneath receiver. I happen to really like Chris Olave of Ohio State. I think he's ridiculously underrated. Obviously, he's your speed guy who I think should go in the middle of round one but is probably a late first round pick. And then you get a guy like Jahan Dotson, who is not as big as Drake London. is not as fast as Chris Olave. He's just a fantastic receiver. I mean, he plays fast, he plays big, and he catches everything in sight. So I, I think it depends on the type of receiver that you're actually looking for. 
my latest mock, I had Dotson going to the Chiefs at 30. You think that's a realistic pick? I have him as a first round pick. I have his late first round pick. Uh, I, I think what happens is when you get to the bottom half or the bottom couple less selections of round one, you never know what's going to happen because uh, those teams are competitive teams. They're playing for con- a division and conference titles, playing to get into the Super Bowl. So they are not always looking for best player available. They are maybe looking for that one piece to fit in that will get them over the uh, hump. So, I, I mean, I like Jahan Dotson. I have a first round grade on him. When I take a look at it, in fact, we'll do this after the break. I want to get into a few more of the depth guys because I think this is a a nice draft for that. You've heard us talk about these things before. These are built bars, and you have to take advantage of them. The new year is rolling, whether your resolution is or not, but these things are here to help you, whether they're a meal replacement or a, a substitute for something that you normally would take in, maybe isn't quite as healthy for you. All you have to do is try the the puffs or try the marshmallow flavors or any of these, like the coconut almond, you have the toffee almond, uh, all kinds of options for you that taste great. They taste like a candy bar. They provide the protein that you need, 130 calories on average, four grams of sugar, four grams of net carbs, and 17 grams of protein that you need to get through the day. And they're all covered in real, actual real chocolate. So you get a taste of what you're looking for as well. You can replace meals. You can actually supplement meals. You can do whatever you need to do to get through the day. And we have a special offer for you. Go to built.com and use our code LOCKED15 to get 15% off of your order. Use the promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. And we're back with Tony Pauli from Pro Football Network as well as Believe. We're talking about wide receivers, and I keep looking at some of these guys that are values on day three, and I see names like Kyle Phillips, Jared Stearns, a couple of others that hit me like maybe because of the way they've been used in college, that they're going to be a selection that reminds us of somebody that can make a, a role early in their career, much like Hunter Renfro has done it in Las Vegas by being a day three selection. Does that hold true for you? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm glad you say that because everybody focuses on the first round and they, you know, whenever I do these interviews as well, who are they going to get at 16? What about 20? And the draft is seven rounds for a reason. And the really good teams can find talent in the later rounds. Uh, you know, there may be a disagreement uh, on the player. But, yeah, I, I mean, just about every position except for maybe center. But even the, there's some good late-day centers, uh, late, I say late-round centers. Uh, you, you can find talent. It's just a matter of, you know, getting that player and developing the player. What happens in the late rounds is, Teams really start to go towards the size speed guys, the guys that have, you know, the next level computer numbers because they feel those are the easier guys to develop and they have the higher upside. But, yeah, you can find talent uh, through the late rounds of the draft, whether it's receiver, whether it's offensive tackle. I got to put you on the spot about one guy because he's my my latest uh, crush here, and that's uh, Khalil Shakir from Boise State, a guy that I think I can do a little bit of all. I have him just barely in the top 100. What do you think of that area for him? I think I have him a little bit lower than that. I know a lot of people fell in love with him at the senior ball. He's a good route runner. He catches the ball well. Let's see how fast he runs at the uh, combine. I'd be surprised if he gets under four four five. And while four four five was a good time at, at, at one, uh, you know, was a good speed at one time, good forty time at one time. It really isn't at this, at this uh, uh, state. I mean, he's a nice receiver. He doesn't do anything just to blow me away. Okay, fair enough. So if we flip it over and somebody has to cover them, I think this this particular group of DBs, I think kind of hits the hybrid mark more than the, the traditional versions of, of corner and safety. But Daxton Hill can play a couple of ways. I think Kyle Hamilton can play all over the field. Is that the trend at the DB spots that you need to be a jack of all trades? Well, I, I think that's everything in football. I mean, you look at whether it be DB, whether it be linebacker, you know, you want those three down the linebackers. You, the two down run defenders are, are basically pushed down the draft boards. You know, even your defensive linemen, you want guys who not only hold the point, but can rush the passer and even drop off the line and, and play in space on zone blitzes. So, yeah, I, I mean, what, what you're seeing a lot of is because it's such a passing league and because there's such a need for guys who can cover what's happening now is some of your bigger safeties, your bigger college safeties are being projected to outside linebacker or being used at outside linebacker in the next level, which it's interesting because I've said all along, as we get closer to the draft, I think people are going to start, you're going to start hearing more and more about people talking about Kyle Hamilton 
who has a better projection outside linebacker at the next level rather than free safety. Uh, that'll be really interesting to me. I, I'm looking for the nickel type guys that can play in space, hit the robber kind of role. And really, I feel like when I look at the class overall, the thing that stands out to me is that it's a little bit lacking in the true ball hawks, the guys that attack the ball and take it away. Is there one guy that stands out to you, maybe maybe even a, a day three guy that stands out that maybe bucks that system? Lewis C. of Georgia, who's going to be a second round pick. Uh, he's an explosive Free safety type who goes sideline to sideline, real good ball skills, gets to the flanks in, in, you know, in, a, in a split second uh, to play the ball when it's in the air. I think he's ridiculously underrated. I, I think there are a couple of real good safeties in day two. Louis Seen, Nick Cross of, uh, Louis Seen of Georgia, Nick Cross of uh, Maryland. I like Jaquan Brisker of Penn State a lot. Jalen Petrie of, uh, of Baylor. You mentioned Daxton Hill. Verone McKinley of Oregon, who's got terrific ball skills, not the tallest guy in the world, and that's going to set up some uh, coverage mismatches because the taller six foot, six foot one, six foot two receivers are going to be able to get over him and high point the passes. But, but I think all those guys, I would rather take a who was seen in round two than say a uh, Kyle Hamilton in the top ten. I hope that they find the fit. It doesn't matter to me who it is, just as long as they find the fit. Folks, that's Tony Paul, and you can find him Pro Football Network and over on the Believe Network. Tony, anywhere else that we should be looking for you? As I tell my wife, just Google my name, and you'll find out where I am at that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for making the time today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.